Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks to Pam D, our mutual friend, for making it happen. It's been uh, a while. We've really, really enjoyed uh, looking forward to this. Thank you for being here. You bet. You know, it's funny, on the way over, um, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're certainly going to cover the story of Paul Mitchell and the story of Patron, but he's already talking about what's next and how to disrupt an industry. What did you share with me oh, sure. in, in the golf cart, and what, what's next that you're working on? What's nice for especially students to know is the world's in front of you, and you can use it any way you want. If someone were to tell you, why don't you go to competition now with iPhone or Samsung, you'd say, are you crazy? They have billions of dollars, and they have a majority of the market, and number two, three, and four companies are OK. But how do you compete with someone like that? Well, that's what I did. And uh, this is the world's most advanced smartphone. It's in a case, so that's why I'm showing you what it is. But uh, how do you go into competition with these guys? This phone will do things that no phone in the world will do. And I, I can show you just very quickly here to give you an idea. It's called a rocket phone, R-O-K-I-T. We just launched it three weeks ago, but we only launched it to the tech community. In the first week, we got over four million hits on our website from all over the world. People just wanting to see, can this possibly be? What this phone does that no phone will do, and I can just show you very quickly here, is it will show you in 3D. He's seen it already, and I'll just show some of you in front. I can show you later, too. But it'll show you in 3D movies without glasses. This is the future. I'll show you, give you an example. I like to use Avatar. That's a pretty good one, because most people have seen Avatar or know a little bit about it here. So let's use Avatar here. Oh, let's see here. It, it's obviously difficult for everyone to see, but walk, oh, but driving I, over here, you're really blown away that like it's rich in its depth. Oh, very rich. You can see the front row here anyways. 3D without glasses. <laughs> Is that wild? Is that wild? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 3D without glasses. What this phone also does to be a disruptor, we wanted to do several things that were a little different. One. It has 3D without glasses, and we have a variety. I think we bought over 300 of the best uh, 3D films in the world, so we would have the inventory. Let me shut it off here. There we go. So we'd have the inventory. It also has dual SIMs, so you could have up to two SIMs in it. It's unblocked for the world. It's one phone you can use anywhere in the world. It has built-in world Wi-Fi. You're anywhere near Wi-Fi, you call anybody in the world free. It also comes with telemedicine for a year seven days a week, 24 hours a day, a doctor's on the phone with you, looking at you, diagnosing you, telling you what's wrong, or it's an emergency, go to an emergency hospital. If you have the flu or something needs medication, they will write your prescription, send it to your pharmacy, or if you're in the middle of nowhere, they'll GPS where you are to the nearest pharmacy there. That's just a few of these things on the phone. Dual cameras, by the way, a camera for normal, and a camera for 3D. It'll take 3D pictures, too. Now, here's the big disruptor. Besides doing things that telephones don't do, it's the most advanced phone ever put out. We have different sizes, this size and the next size smaller. Uh, and the, the big one is this. This phone cost me twice, maybe a little more than twice, what any iPhone or Samsung costs to make. It's very, very sophisticated. When we did some research on it, it's people like this with a phone like this want to pay about 1500 It's very, very advanced. Most phones go today, your really good ones, from $700 up to almost 2000 We want to disrupt it. Plus, we want to put in the hands of everybody. This phone I just showed you is $299 retail. The smaller one's $199 retail. No strings attached. No company you have to be attached to for five years in order to qualify for that. It's just right there. So we call that a disruptor. This will be the largest company I have. He's already told you about a couple of our couple billion dollar companies. This will top them all. Uh, anyways, we will officially get it in stores in Walmarts and, oh my God, Costco and several others in June. But if you want to see even more details on it, go to Rocket, R-O-K-I-T, rocketphones.com. Tell you all about it. Is that a pitch? <laughs> Is that a pitch? <laughs> a disruptor. A disruptor. So you can still, I just want to play say, you can still, you can find things in life that you don't think there's something to do with. And we'll talk about Paul Mitchell and Patron as we go on. But there's always a catch or something different you could do and compete in an industry that you never thought you could compete with or against big guys you never thought you could compete with. Use your mind. You know, as I was being wowed by the technology, the pitch is what got me. And just watching someone, this is like watching 
you know, LeBron James play basketball, watching you pitch, watching you sell something, it truly is the best of the best. And I want to talk about that in a minute when we get to sales. Um, for a little bit of context, the, the trailer was a great setup in terms of like giving a little bit of an overview of your life. Uh, we just want to talk a little bit about your background, your childhood, and then we'll sort of shift forward into your business career. Sure. So you grew up fairly close to here. Can you talk about your childhood and your family growing sure. up and where you, where you uh, were a kid? I was born right on El Dorado by where the Hollywood Freeway is right now. It was called the Queen of Angels Hospital long gone before your parents were born. It would disappear and became an office building a long, long time ago. But I grew up around the Echo Park area, East LA. And then when I got into uh, junior high school, we moved to a little area called Atwater. It's right by Echo Park, but still close to downtown LA. And uh, grew with my mom, my brother. We had a deadbeat dad, so it was just uh, three of us growing up together. And I, and I say quite well in, in the documentary, Good Fortune. We had very little, but never knew it because we didn't know any better. We didn't have a TV set, so we didn't know what anybody else did. And we had a lot of love. We had a lot of love, we had food on the table, and we thought we were really cool. Uh, I know my first entrepreneur job uh, was at the Variety Boys Club on Mott Street in East LA, where in Woodshop, you could get a quarter's worth of wood on credit. They wouldn't give it to you, it's on credit. And then my brother and I built flower boxes, these big, beautiful wooden flower boxes, and we hit the street selling it for 50 cents. It took a couple of days, but we sold one, and it cost us a quarter. We went back, gave the quarter, and then took the other quarter, bought more wood, and this time we get to keep the 50 cents. So it was my first experience as an entrepreneur starting out very young. I've worked the majority of my life, uh, started with a consistent job when I was 11 years old, uh, paper routes. We had a paper here in LA called the LA Examiner. It was the biggest morning paper. It's not a morning paper anymore. Uh, the, I believe the Times is a big one here now. It was just, you know, sales of newspapers. Uh, we had a paper out, and I did that until uh, I was 14. And after junior high school or high school, I always had a job all the way through the day. And in high school, it struck me in one of the things I saw, you always hope that teachers and professors are encouraging along the way and, and, and <laughs> propelling their students forward. What was the sage encouragement you received from one of your teachers at John Marshall High School? I love it. And by the way, when he said, who's going graduate from Marshall, I raised my hand, because <laughs> I graduated from John Marshall High School here in LA, so I'm a Marshall guy. Now, it was in the 11th grade, and it was Business 101. And Mr. Wax was our teacher, and a young lady was sitting behind me named Michelle Gillian. And Michelle and I were buddies. We used to pass notes. So she'd sit behind me, I'd write a little note, and you'll kind of pass it to her. Mr. Wax busted us one day and read the note to the class. It was something innocuous like, hey, I'll see you after school at Winchell's and uh, Bobby and Darlene are going steady. Something really stupid. But he read it to the class. And he said, class, see these two here? You shouldn't hang out with them. They're never going to amount to anything. After high school, I went into the Navy. I got back to the United States from the US Navy and serving overseas. I'm a Vietnam vet. And uh, one of my pals came and said, God, JP, your buddy Michelle Gillian, aren't we proud of her? I said, I haven't talked to Michelle in quite a few years now. Why, what'd she do? He says, you don't know? I said, no, JP. Her name is now Michelle Phillips. The mamas and papas, the thin one, that's Michelle Gilliam. She became a big entertaining superstar Then, of course, later on television and movies. When I turned 50 years old, Michelle found Mr. Wax and brought him down to an old hangout we had called El Cholo on Western Avenue near 11th Street, right? <laughs> he brought him down there, and we told him the story. Well, I don't remember this. Well, we do. <laughs> we made it okay, you know. <laughs> and he, he was the same old Mr. Wax, just an old huffy buffy, you know, just done. Anyway, so that was cool, but we didn't believe him. We didn't believe what he said. Oh, um, the things that, like, you know, are defining in your life, you know, as a kid, that someone may have said something in passing, but it can affect you your entire life, and you remember it, you know, 50, 60 years later. So after high school, you said you mentioned you went to the Navy, mm -hmm. um, both as Naval, Naval Reserve and the Navy. Just Good. a lesson or two that you learned from the Navy. You bet. One of the biggest lessons I learned in the Navy, and I, I told it to the world, actually, most people in the military, when I got the uh, Sailor Award in Washington, D.C. about seven years ago, how do you relate civilian life to naval life? And I brought up the one best example. I graduated from high school, went straight into the Navy. In fact, I was in the reserves while I was in high school. Went right in the Navy at 17 years old before I turned 18. And in the Navy, we learned how to take ordinary people like myself, work together as a team, and come up with extraordinary results. And that's why I got in the military. 
Plus, we got to see Asia free on a big aircraft carrier. You know, that was nice, too. Yeah, fall in love with the ocean maybe a little bit oh, later nice. on. The ocean was very, very it's, nice. Uh, yes. It's such a defining experience for someone at that age. You describe yourself as a salesperson first and a businessman second. Can you share with us the importance of sales skills and what are some of the things you sold early in your career? You bet you. Selling is not trying to convince somebody to get something. Selling is truly helping somebody make the right decision. And the way you do that is with features and benefits. Like, here's the feature. It has Wi-Fi for the world. I followed up with the benefit. You call anywhere in the world free. So you want to have the feature of whatever your product or service is. Another very important thing in selling or anything you do that comes along with selling is there's two things you've got to do if you want to be successful. Do not go into the selling business with your product. Don't go in the reorder business. What does that mean? It means that your service or your product is so good, people will want to reorder it again. This way, when you give your presentation, it adds validity to it that what you're saying is true. Once they get there, they're going to like it so much, they're going to reorder. Or if it's a service, tell other people about it. Very, very important. It's the most important thing. Unless something is sold, something doesn't work. The manufacturing, the industry world, it just doesn't work. You've got to sell somebody on a product, an idea, or why they should have something or why something is different. Extremely important. And as I'm sure you know by now, but I'll remind you, when you do sell or when you're presenting something to people, always look them in the eye. If you cannot look them in the eye, and so many times we have pe problems looking someone in the eye, we still feel comfortable around them, look in between the eyes or at their eyebrows. It looks like you're looking them straight in the eye. So you have that communication. Another great thing in communicating is when the other person starts talking, even if you're in the middle of a presentation or an important sentence, be quiet. Don't say a word. He started talking because he's already ahead of you. And they're gonna want, he's going to want to talk. So wait, hear what he has to say, hear him out, then go back and finish your presentation right after that, but hear the person out. Very, very important. If somebody says no to you, the best way to realize that you haven't convinced them. That's all that it is. Unless they say no three times, three times, it's you haven't convinced me. But you can't say, well, no, you're wrong. Let me tell you about this. You have to go into it easily from a no to, well, let me tell you something else. So the way you do that, and I did the selling encyclopedias door to door, and it worked pretty good, is the minute somebody says no, you, you got to agree with them. Because if you don't, you're fighting. They're defensive now, and you're aggressive, right? You don't do that. What you do is use these beautiful words. Wow, I can appreciate that. I really can. I can understand how you think that way. I don't want to buy more Paul, any Paul Mitchell products. So I have all these other products on my shelf. I can appreciate that. I really can. You're right. However, <laughs> then, you, then you go into whatever you have. There is an extra close. However, that's a master's class in selling, by the way. <laughs> that's a, like that's job training and ma that's. I can a, tell you a lot more, but I know we have a lot of things to cover. It's tonight. so that, good. These are basic things that are really, really good. And, and talking about features and benefits, as you, a quick way to remember is like. Features tell and benefits sell. That's why he always went to the benefits because that's actually what closes the deal. So you sold encyclopedias, you sold office equipment. Oh, tech, tech, dictating equipment, copy phones. Uh, oh my God, listen, insurance. copy machines, life insurance, medical uh, linens. I sold a lot. Even dro drove a tow truck once. And and a lot door to door, knocking on doors, getting doors slammed, and being told no a lot. That's correct. In fact, when I launched Paul Mitchell, we had no money. I, I, Paul Mitchell was started with seven hundred dollars. I lived in my car. And uh, we, I went door to door. I went right up into a boulevard here in the San Fernando Valley, beauty salon to beauty salon, door to door, presenting my products and why they're different. And so from you know, so the early sales days and encyclopedias and insurance and all the things you named, then you got into the beauty business. And I just want to cover the, the, those two jobs you had where it's always interesting when people pay you on commission and you outperform their expectations, things can happen. So people will say, deals, people negotiate or renegotiate deals or they get in fights when things go really bad or they go really well. How did you do in your selling positions at, uh, I think it was Redkin and yeah. then the second? At Redkin, the, it is to try, I'll try Redkin first. At Redkin, I moved up the ladder very, very quickly as a business person. I'm not a hairdresser, really up the ladder at Redkin. In fact, I was uh, their national uh, director, national manager of two of their divisions. 
And I was going by this one room that was full of marmoset monkeys. They're a little monkey, really, really cute. And the room was maybe 12 by 12, had a door with a window that's maybe a foot square. But when you looked out the window, you saw the hallway, nothing else. So I went by as upper management, and I said, you know, when do you take these monkeys for a walk? You know, is it like after hours? They said, no, we don't take them for walks. I said, well, how about I buy a leash? They're cute little monkeys. I take them for a walk. They said, nope, can't do that. I said, well, why do you have them in cages all day long, and you're testing on them? Uh, why are you doing this? Because we're making hair care products at Redken. They're not going through the skin. He says, just calm down. He says, because it makes us look good. It's Redken, the scientific approach. And I basically said, well, that's a bunch of bullshit. That's so what I said. You know, why are you doing this? this is wrong. These little animals you're testing on, so you look good. Anyways, that did not go over good with upper management. They fired me two weeks later. Gone, okay? Went to work for a place called the Institute of Trichology Tri. It was a very small hair care company. And I made a deal with them because they didn't have a lot of money. I said, I'll work for you for $3,000 a month, which was a cut and pay for me, and 6% of all new sales. So it's business you don't have right now. I'll manage what you have right now, I'll create new sales for you. He goes, oh, great, heck of a deal. After one year, I tripled their sales. So I went in and I talked with the owners and they said, JP, we have to let you go. I said, why? Because you made more money than we did. But I just built your business up. They said, well, that commission got you, man. We had no idea you'd sell that much. I said, yeah, but look how much more you guys made. They said, we have David Chapman, that was the guy's name, who could do your job at one third the cost. We have to let you go, it's economics. So they let me go. Well, long story short, two years after I started Paul Mitchell, they came back and said, we will give you half the company free if you'll run it for us. I said, no, I'm already off with John Paul Mitchell system, so no. Uh, that's great. So in between there, you, uh, you didn't have a steady job. Was that one of the sort of lower points between those jobs and Paul Mitchell? Was well, there a gap yeah, there? Well, some of the low parts were prior to Paul Mitchell, when I was doing some other things, in fact, a real low part was between selling encyclopedias and doing all these other jobs of... I'd stopped selling encyclopedias, went into being a, uh, an announcer at the uh, trade, vacation, recreational vehicle shows, uh, and I was married at the time with a two-and-a-half-year-old son, and that was a real low point. I came home one day, and my wife, we were very young. I was 20 years old when I had a child, and my wife was a year younger than me. She couldn't handle being a mom, so drove up the driveway. She came down the steps of our apartment, grabbed the key, said, I'm running. I'll be right back in a minute, took off with her only car. When I got up to the very top of the steps, there was my little two and a half year old son sitting there in a pile of clothes with a note and said, I can't handle being a mom anymore. He's gonna be better off with you. Uh, and then I find out that what little we had in savings was gone. She hadn't paid the rent in three months. We were kicked out basically and I didn't even know it, nor had she paid the power bills. Within two days, we were out of that place, no power, no rent, we were evacuated and no car. So that was a real low point. And uh, I had found someone that had an old Cadillac that I borrowed with a blown fuel pump, I mean water pump. So I put water in every four hours to keep this thing running. And my first thing was, how am I going to eat? I don't get a paycheck for another week. And she cleaned me out of everything. You know, how are we going to eat? So when you're really down that low, you start using your head a little bit like, well, where, where am I going to eat? So I went around collecting pop bottles. Coca-Cola, 7-Up. And in those days, you got two cents for a little bottle and you got a nickel for a big one. And in those days, this was the, uh, the mid-60s, in those days also, every grocery store and every liquor store had to take them from you and give you the money. And that's how we started to survive. And then a few weeks later, ran across a friend of mine, he heard what was going on, and uh, he, he was a uh, hell's angel, Satan's slave. It's a badass motorcycle clubs of yesterday, maybe today too, I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, and I went to uh, live with him in the next room he had at the house, and they gave me a helping hand watching my son while it's, uh, it's interesting how at each inflection point, you know, there's someone there to help us if you sort of that make yourself great. available. Sure. So that was, that was critical. So let's talk about Paul Mitchell and sure. meeting him. Uh, what was the year? I, I don't remember the year offhand that you met him. And why did you see this as an opportunity that just was different, had an advantage, and why did you decide to sort of jump in? Very good. Uh, Paul and I were pals from 1971, my first year in the professional beauty industry and met him. I was in sales, he was like one of the top artists around, Ex exceptional fine fellow. And he had some great ideas on hair. 
and a big following as kind of a guru of hair design, and I knew business, marketing, and product development from working for the other companies. So we thought, hey, why don't we start our own company? And th these thoughts were going through us in 1979. So I said, Paul, let's do this. You own 30% of the company, I own 30% of the company, and we get someone, we need a half a million dollars. There's no way we could start this out half a million dollars. We need a half a million dollars, and we'll give them 40%. Well, we found a guy. He was out of the island of Jersey, outside of England, tax-free haven, and he was our man. Came the day the money was supposed to arrive, I quit everything I was doing, gave, which later became my ex-wife, the house, the nice car, all the money, had a couple hundred bucks in my pocket, so that she'd be fine with my daughter for you know, quite a while. And I knew money's coming down the hill. So I took the old car down, right? Went down the hill uh, to the bank, no money. No money, no money, no money. I found out later on through Mr. Dick Holthouse, who helped arrange it, that the guy pulled out. He pulled out because, this is very good for you to know, so you know how easy it is today compared to those days to start a business. The last minute he says, I have to pull out. Now it's 1980. Inflation in the United States was 12.5%. Unemployment in the United States was 10.5%. You had to wait in line to get gasoline. And our hostages were still in Iran. And if you got a loan, if you could get a loan, prime rate, your cheapest interest was 17%. Terrible times. That's how we started. I basically, Paul came over. He wanted some money. He was living in Hawaii at the time. Got a flight over because he wanted a little bit for himself. He was running out of money. He's a little bit older than I was. And there was no money. So I said, Paul, how much can you afford? He says, JP, 350 bucks, that's it. I'm running out of money myself. And I only had a few hundred bucks in my pocket. I had to live. So I drove to my mother's house. I didn't tell her what was going on. I said, Mom, I'm starting something new. Can I borrow $350? She goes, why? You have a good job. You make good money. I didn't have the heart to tell her that, Mom, I don't even have a house now. I moved out. I started this business. There is no money. I, I didn't have the heart to say that. I was too proud because I could have had my old room back. It was still there. No one stayed in that room for many, many years, still in the house. She would have fed me incredible, but I was too proud. So I slept in my car, went to Griffith Park to take showers, ate at the Freeway Cafe breakfast for 99 cents, went to El Torito at happy hour, where you got little tostadas or little chicken wings. 20 chicken wings later, you're full. And from 4.30 till 6 o'clock, they had happy hour. So you would get salsa, chicken wings, anything to get drinkers in early because no one came in until after 6 o'clock. It worked pretty good. I was there every single day, brought my little kid with me, sit down here, eat. Pretty soon they caught on to what was going on. So they would sneak us an enchilada or a salad every now and then. And, uh, of course, when we finally made it, I went back and thanked them all profusely. Uh, I know when there was a special done on me with CNBC, they did a major special a few years ago. They did not believe that happened. I said, yes, it did. I lived in my car. How'd you get out of your car? A lady came by one day, knocked on the window, named Joanna Pettit. She was an actress of the day, and said, I heard you were parked down the street, or JP, what happened? I explained it to her. She said, I'm going to give you a room for a couple of months in my house to help you out, and she did. CNBC found Joanna Pettit. She was living in Temecula. They found her there, and uh, she called me. I called her on the phone. It was like reuniting again, and she'll have all the hair care she needs for the rest of her life. <laughs> <laughs> As well, she said, I'm sure the person who, uh, who didn't invest $500,000 could oh. be the worst financial decision of his life or her life, uh, whoever didn't make that investment. So just give us a glimpse of, before we move on to Patron, a glimpse of the growth of Paul Mitchell uh, through the 80s, and then obviously there was a... a uh, a very big change in the business and the partnership in 1989 and how your role changed. That is correct. That. Uh, we started in 1980, had no money, and people ask, well, when did you know you were going to make it? When did you start making money? It was two years before we were able to pay our bills on time. Not pay them off, but pay them on time. At that point, our bills were paid on time, and we had $4,000, $2,000 each. And we thought, we're on top of the world. That was a, it was, because we were, you know, we were very, very down there anyways. So we made it. And it grew rather slowly because I had no money. But then it just started taking off. It took off because once someone used our products, we invented sculpting foam. We invented sculpting lotion. We invented quite a few cool little things. And then we showed hairstylists how to use it. We held classes in salons, major beauty shows to show them how to use it. And the company grew. And every year, it's grown every single year for 39 years now. Uh, and I also will tell you to take care of your people. 
My turnover in 39 years, I'm in 105 countries throughout the world, and I'm 39 years old, my company that is. My turnover is around 100 people worldwide. We take really good care of our people. So times went on. In 1989, two major things happened. One, Paul Mitchell died. He was a hairdresser. We used his name on the products because we sold hairdressers. He died of pancreatic cancer. And we were starting to use Paul in ads to be the front man. When Paul died, he was the hair, hairdresser. He was the guy we used in some of our ads when we just started. And the word was, these guys are going to fall apart now. That one hairdresser, they go to hairdressers, they're not going to retail, it's over. I immediately got in the ads myself and started going on the circuit of television shows and speaking. So now they had somebody else, one of the, ori the original partner there, to actually be out there. And I kind of took the business part and the PR part and put them together and we ran with it. That same year, I started Patron Tequila. I started Patron in 1989, uh, and it was, a, it was a, a real breakthrough in tequila. Nobody ever had in the United States an ultra-premium tequila. I thought there was, a, there was a, a time for that one, and it happened by accident. I'm building a house on the West Coast, and my guy who was building the house with me, my contractor, was going to Mexico to buy some pavers. And he said, JP, I'm going to buy some pavers. I said, well, while you're down there, take Martin Crowley with you, who's in the paver business. I put him in the architectural business. And bring back what some of the aristocratic Mexicans drink. Maybe it's a smoother tequila. We don't have to mix it or lick the salt and, the, and then hold your breath and down it, you know, and then see the Technicolor Mule the next day. You know, something different. So he brought back a couple of bottles of very, very smooth tequila, just a very tall bottle, nondescript. It was smoother than anything we ever tasted. And he said, uh, we can make it smoother. I met this guy, Francisco, they can make it smoother. I said, great, let's try it. He did it. I instantly ordered 1,000 cases, that's 12,000 bottles, brought them back. <laughs> Nobody wanted to buy them. They said it's the smoothest tequila in the world, but the average tequila in 1989 sold for four to five dollars a bottle. The best one out there was fourteen dollars a bottle. Patron was so expensive to make we had to sell it for thirty seven dollars a bottle. Nobody would take us on. So we found a little wine place here that only sold wine in Southern California and they became our distributor. Then I went knocking door to door. Uh, Martin went to the Baja Cantina, for example, my partner Marina Del Rey. I went and saw Wolfgang Puck at Spago's. I virtually went door to door just like I did salon to salon with Paul Mitchell when I started and door to the encyclopedias to sell our products. And that's how we took off. We dropped the small wine distributor. And this is something good for you all to know. We took on Jim Beam, big whiskey company, big distribution for the United States. And after a couple of years, they were only doing about 12,000 cases a year. And we said, guys, you should be doing a lot more. It's the best tequila on the market. They go, yes, we know, but it's the best ever made. But the price point's too high. People just aren't going to pay that much. That's why you don't push it that much. So we said, well, we don't, we don't agree with you. So we dropped Jim Beam and took on Seagram's as our overall distributor. Big company Seagram's, right? They took it up to 70,000 cases a year. More than the 20,000 Jim Beam thought they could get to maximum, they got up to 70. We thought we could do a better job. We took over our distribution, went to court with Seagram's, paid them off. And I'll just make a very long story short. Last year, Patron uh, sold, was it about 4 million cases, Pam? About 40 million <laughs> bottles? Is that what we sold last year? About 40 million, 40 million bottles. It became the largest tequila company in the world, and all we sell is high-end, ultra-premium tequila. So if people say you can't do something, don't believe them. If your quality is that good, just keep on pushing it and pushing and pushing until you get across. Jeez. That's uh and, and Patron, uh, Patron started in 89, yep. so here we are, what, 30 years old now? Uh -huh. And um, uh, it became very popular with yep. celebrities. Clint Eastwood included it in a movie, the which was pretty Clint, cool. Yep. And then uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, music and hip-hop took it as well. Sure did. Um, last year, are we in 2018, when you decided to sell it mm -hmm. to Bacardi? What went into that decision and that you knew it was time uh, to part with your baby. Yeah, Bacardi had a small interest in the company. I was a majority shareholder. And it was great growing. Paul Mitchell will never be sold, because that is the original baby. But Patron, I thought, you know, one day I would. And they, they asked me, my partner Bacardi said, JP, at what, at what price would you sell? I said, guys, 
one, I don't have to sell it. You know, I'm, I'm fine with money. You know, but if I did sell it, it'd have to be at least five million dollars, five billion dollars. The biggest liquor company ever sold in the history of the world was Grey Goose several years ago. Grey Goose sold for two point five billion. I said, and that, no, it's two point two billion. Sorry, two point two billion is what they sell for. I said it's got to be over five billion. Well, they came back a short time later and said, "How about five billion one hundred million?" And you could still be the chairman emeritus forever. You could still have free patrol as long as you live. <laughs> if we have a big event going on, you can go there. We'll pay your expenses. We won't give you any money because we're giving you a lot of money. And you go to your hacienda whenever you want. You know, and we're, we'll be all friendly and we'll try. I said, "Fine, it's done." It's a deal. <laughs> And I may add, when I got that big fetch, by the way, they wouldn't give me a check. I really wanted a check so I could photograph. They wouldn't give me a check. They had to this is too big. But when I did get it, it great, being grateful is very important in life. I was so grateful for all that happened. The first check I wrote immediately was for $50 million, and that's to a charitable thing. It was the first thing I wanted to give, I wanted to give back. So I put $50 million bucks into charity. Very first check I wrote. So You are the easiest interview ever. You cover everything perfectly in order. It's just really. No, but I'll come up with other stuff. Uh, no, I'm enjoying okay. it. So we talk about gratitude and, and the, the core values that you hold in high regard personally that you try and instill in your company culture. You mentioned that your turnover is exceedingly low. What are some of the core values that you take personally and then want them as part of your companies? Great. Uh, and this is good to know in your personal life and good to know in your business life when you get out there. One is, I've worked for people before who had very little money in my pocket, maybe a dollar. You can't get a lot of things for lunch for one dollar. So I knew that when it comes to the point where we make enough money, everyone that works for John Paul Mitchell Systems gets free lunch. They, they still get to take free lunch. You order off menus, whatever you want. It's bought it from several restaurants to you. So everyone in the company gets free lunch, period. I don't want to do that. Also, I've had people that I worked for let me call it old style management, where they said, now I want you to do this. Well, why? Because I said so, I'm the boss, period, right? That's not very nice. Or if you did something wrong and you didn't know you're doing it wrong, or if you know you did it wrong, yeah, they, they tell you off in front of other people. Never made me feel good. So I started doing a couple things uh, because I wanted to be treated the way I wanted to be treated if I was in someone else's shoes. So a couple things I'll share with you. Number one, if ever you reprimand somebody, Always do it behind closed doors and privately with nobody around. The minute you tell somebody something bad in front of anybody else so they could hear it, you're going to have covert hostility. They're the person going to stab you in the back every time they can because you were so mean to them. And you told them off and made them you know, look terrible in front of someone else. You don't want to do that. But how do you tell somebody off or basically reprimand them for the challenge they have but make them feel good when they walk out of your office. Because when somebody says you did something wrong, especially the boss, you don't feel good. It's like, oh God, you kind of bummed out during the day. Or your mom or dad said you really screwed up and you, know, you just don't feel good after that because you disappointed them. But there's a way to do it where people walk out happy. You have this in your mind before you do it. One, what did they do wrong? Now chances are that some of them didn't know they were doing it wrong. They didn't know how to do it right. So number one is I wanted to tell you uh, how I want this particular job done or this particular event done. Here's how to do it. You know, whether you know how to do it or not, I want to tell you how I want it done. And then I'm going to tell you why I want it done this way. So you tell them what they did wrong by showing them how you want it done, but why you want it done that way. Okay, so now they got the message and they got the instructions how to do it. But you want to be on top of the world. You already know before you bring them in something good they do already. So before they leave, you say, you know, you are one of the best people we've ever had here. You come on time. Everybody likes you. You answer the phone with a smile. You are super cool. And someone as great as you, I know, will do this little extra bit even that much better. Thank you for being part of our family. We really appreciate you. Now they walk in, and they're just happy as can be when they walk out. Uh, it's the opposite for praising somebody. If somebody does something good, try and tell them in front of somebody else or in front of a group of people so someone can hear and they know someone else is hearing you uh, uh, applauding them. You know, you did something really good. God, this is really great. You did something really good. And what is your name? Leo, you are a knockout buddy. You did something. So you paid attention. You took 
notes. You did everything. Your skateboard isn't worn off too bad. You are just so cool. Leo is exceptional. Thank you, Leo, for coming to this, man. I really appreciate you. It makes you feel good, right? And I, I said it loud enough, so hopefully the whole room heard it. <laughs> but I don't like to. <laughs> All good. <laughs> yeah, there you go. In, in other words, yeah, those, those, are, those are some of the things I learned. And take care of your people. Take very good and listen to your people. There are many times where I want to do something, and even Ann, who's with me today, is my West Coast executive assistant from Paul Mitchell. Ann, stand up, because you, you are a gem. Stand up, man. This is Ann, okay? <laughs> Ann, supposedly the chairman of the board and the founder of the company. I'll do something. Ann will say, well, JP, maybe we shouldn't do it this way. I think it'd be better if we did it this way. What do you think? She explains to me why. And I go, Ann, you're 100% right. And many of our staff are the same way. They know they can speak to me about anything they want or even a regular up a day, up uh, management that's really up there that does day to day, my presidents, my vice presidents. They know that anyone can speak to them about anything, whether they're right or wrong. That is the uh, charisma that we have within our company. That is our culture. We also have a culture of giving back. Our people participate in giving back, not because they have to. One day I came to the office, there was nobody there. Two people were in the whole office. And where is everybody? It's two in the afternoon. Oh, they're down at Santa Monica Beach. What are they doing down there? It's, you know, Thursday after whatever. It is. They're picking up papers. We decided to volunteer to clean up, to clean up the beach. Well, that's nice of you guys. Very, very nice. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was good. Uh, so the great points on company culture and how to treat people um, and how to manage. When you don't have that um, uh, where coworkers and employees aren't comfortable with giving bad news or disagreeing with the boss, then you get surprises and you get, you know, information's not flowing freely. That's correct. And you get into a lot of troubles. Um, do you have, do you have a personal philosophy? Success sort of unshared is failure. That's a big one. And definitely, it's the golden rule. And they just don't talk about it enough. Do unto others as you'll have others do unto you. That is one of the best rules in the world. Treat others, whether you're saying hello in the morning or for anything, or someone that's really pissed off at the airport, treat them like it would be you. If that was you, how would you want someone to treat you? Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. And success, unshared, is failure. If you have a job, but you don't have extra money, help someone else out. Volunteer your time, for example. Go do something. You know, and uh, one of the greatest things in life you'll ever learn is when you do something for somebody else, and ask absolutely nothing in return, you will get the greatest high you have ever had. Because you know you did something for somebody else, you ask nothing in return. I'm a child of the 60s, I'm older than your parents are, okay? And I know what getting high is all about, right? But <laughs> nothing you can smoke compares to doing something for somebody else and just getting that unbelievable rush of giving. It's true. It's biologically true. We all know that when you're in a funk and you're in a bad mood, the best way to get out is to do something for somebody else, and it instantly changes your mood. Yes. So it's, uh, it's proven. Um, you've seen the highest of highs, and you've, you've, you've seen some lows as well. How do you define success, and how does that definition of success differ maybe from early on in your life, if it does at all? That is one of the greatest questions I hope people will ask me. You just have to try and volunteer that one. A great question. Success is not how much money you have, ladies and gentlemen, or what position you have or what title you have. That's not success. Success is how well do you do what you do, especially when nobody else is watching. That's success. If somebody started a job as a janitor and became the best janitor you could ever imagine, that's success. I was a janitor once in high school and got, did such a darn good job because I wanted to keep my job. I was afraid I'd lose it. I would move things. I'd do everything. And I got a quarter an hour raised. And for me, that was a big deal when I was younger. I want to give you an example of success in your mental attitude and how you think about things. Especially today, a lot of people want to just play video games all day long or get on the iPhone or your telephones, call people or do whatever you do, which is fine. I want to tell you about Elena, if I might. Elena was 66 years old. My son was four years old. And Elena was the best nanny you could ever imagine. One day, my wife and I came home. We said, Elena, we're taking John and Anthony out for the afternoon. Next three or four hours, you're off. We'll need you later. But you'll go put your feet up, watch Mexican television. We know you like to do that, you know, and make yourself some lunch. Refrigerator is full. She goes, no, mister, I'm not going to do it. I said, Elena, you're going to get paid. I, want, I mean, I want you to do it. I'll turn the TV on for you, right? Come on, look at Channel 28. No, no, I don't. She said, JP, I'm 66 years old. I don't know if I'm going to live another 10, 15 years. I don't know. 
but I don't want to waste my life sitting watching TV. I'd feel much better if I got my little duster and found places I didn't dust or do something I would have missed or do it a little bit better. That makes me feel worthy. Oh, Elena, she melted me. Well, you should have seen her bonus that year. <laughs> but, but that's the attitude. It's the attitude you have, like in any business you're in, in anything you go into as entrepreneurs or in your own life, it's your attitude. A lot of people say when things are really, really bad, oh my God, how do you, how do you end up with a good attitude? JP, how, how are you positive 99% of the time? Well, it's where you put something. And a couple things I would love to share. Do I have time to tell a little story for two minutes Absolutely long? Absolutely do, sure. Have any of you heard of James Colbert? He was an actor, great actor. Well, before, your parents know who he is, okay. Anyway, Chase, and your grandparents especially. James Colburn, Academy Award winning, one of the greatest actors, dear friend of mine. He told me an interesting story once. He said, JP, tell this story to as many people as you can, because everyone has ups and downs. And he talked about these two priests. They were Zen priests, Zen monks. And they were on a pilgrimage in the Himalayas up to a mountain monastery. And it was a day and a night pilgrimage. They got to a river, and actually I have to walk and show you this. They got to a river, and the river was fast flowing. And they noticed, it was about a foot deep, fast flowing, that off to their right, just a short distance away, was a young, pretty girl sticking her foot in the river and then jumping back. The current was too swift. The older monk, one was younger, one was older, walked over, picked this girl up, held them close, held her close, walked over across the river and set her down, and then the two monks went on that way. That night, they sat down and had dinner, a little campfire, camped out, and the young monk said to the older monk, he said, I have to ask you a question. This has been on my mind all day long since this morning. We take vows never to touch a woman. You not only touched a woman, you picked her up, held her close to your chest, walked her across the river and set her down. Why did you do that? And the older wise monk said, Oh, wow, I left her at the river this morning. You've been carrying her around all day long? Leave it at the river. We all run across problems in our lives with everything you could ever imagine. But by thinking about your problem, I can't pay my bills the next day, I didn't do this, I should have done something differently, solves nothing. Leave it at the river. If you find yourself at night not being able to sleep because you're worrying about something, I, I discovered this in a word, get a piece of paper. Now, does it help me to think about it all night long? I used to think about, I can't pay my bills, what am I going to do? Uh, did it help? No, did help one bit. So I almost said one night, I got, I've got a piece of paper, I wrote down what I was thinking about, right? Can't pay the bills, this is going to be shut off, whatever it was. And then I taped it with a little bit of tape to my bathroom mirror. When you get up in the morning, you usually go to the bathroom, okay? But I taped it up there, and it had it on there. So at night, the minute it came into my head, I said, I don't have to think about it anymore. It's on the mirror. I'll see it in the morning. And it was amazing how fast it got out of my head, and I went to sleep. <laughs> Leave it at the river. Leave we it. all have ups and downs. You cannot change yesterday's newspapers as much as you think. And I, I, I wish I would have said that. I wish I would have done that. Believe me, in my life, there's a lot of things I wish I would have changed. I would have not done that. I would have not seen this person. So much stuff. But you can't think about it. Leave it at the river and move on. It's a... Uh you know, a different frame of reference when you're 18 to 22, most of our undergrads are th that age, and, and you know, my age and your age, and that sort of frames regret as well. You know, there's a lot of things that you regret, and there are a few things you may regret in life. It's usually if you treated someone unkindly, yep. or you did something that compromised your integrity, but it, it's, those are the things that you remember. But being able to look forward, and it seems like your relentless optimism looks forward uh, more than looking backwards is, is a huge advantage in, in your life. Um, before I open up for students, we talked about success. I want to talk about failure. How do you view failure? Um, what's the value of failure? What's the relationship of failure to success, maybe? And, and um, what advice do you give for anyone who's going through it, who's in the sort of the, the lows of a, a failing moment? Gotcha. Failure equals a college class. Out of every failure, you learn something new. And I'm gonna give you some examples. When I sold encyclopedias door to door, I had to be just as enthusiastic on door number 51 as I was in all 50 doors that were closed to my face. But I did it. I'd have to be just as enthusiastic on door number 153 as I was in 152 doors that were closed to my face. In other words, 
no matter what's going on, be prepared in your life for rejection. You're going to get it, period. Everyone's going to get rejection. If you're prepared for it and you know it's coming, it's not going to affect you that way. You're too stupid. You don't have any money. Your idea sucks. You know, you're, you're wrong. everything's wrong about you. Just give up. Jump off a building. Everything's wrong. Bad, 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 right? Don't pay any attention to it. Don't pay attention. Be, because that's, that's rejection. You're going to have it all your life. If you're prepared for it, you'll let it go in one ear and out the other and let your own self move on. Whether it's with your family or whether it's with your education or whether it's with getting a job. And by the way, I have about 115 Paul Mitchell schools throughout the United States. And all of us have a culture. Everyone that goes to Paul Mitchell, they're cosmetology schools. We have a culture of giving back. We have fundraisers and everything else. But we also teach people. We teach people there. How to get along with people you stop getting along with? I'll give you an example. What is your name, sir? Christian. Christian, okay. Christian and I went to high school together. Now I'm 75, and what are you, 18? <laughs> okay, okay. So we went to, okay, well, we, let's say we knew, let's say I was his age. We went to high school together. And he and I were the best of friends. So Christian and I and JP were just the best of buddies. But Christian said something about me that a friend told me that really upset me. I didn't want anything to do with Christian anymore. Okay, or vice versa, right? We weren't friends any longer. Or with a parent. All of a sudden, a parent's pretty upset. Why do you have all these holes in your ears and in your nose? Why do you have all these tattoos? Why are your pants so low? You know, blah, 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 right? And sometimes we just kind of break that communication with somebody that we really like or used to like. Well, how do you get it back and all of a sudden are free-flowing on information? With Christian, I didn't like Christian. Christian didn't like me because I didn't like him. Or vice versa, it was reversed. But there was something great. They were best of friends. The minute I say to Christian, Christian, I don't like you because you did so and so, or you did this, or you did that, or he did it vice versa, he's going to get defensive, and I'm going to become offensive, defensive. You get nowhere that way. So what you do is you take, it's called you win by losing. You take the other way. I find Christian, I call him on the phone, hi, Christian, it's me, John Paul DeGioia. Christian, I wonder if you could please help me. We were the best of friends, Christian, the very best of friends in the world. Something went wrong. I don't know what I did, Christian, but I know I did something wrong that offended you. Please forgive me for whatever it is that I did wrong, Christian. I'm sorry. I'm not that person today. I'm a whole different person. Will you please forgive me whatever it is? Now, Christian may not even remember, or he might. And whenever this is done, more than 50% of the time, the other person comes across and says, God, I don't know really what you did wrong. You know, or, or, you know, or God, I'm really, really sorry. Like a parent, you know, Mom, what was I wrong? Well, we kind of objected. We told you all the earrings and the nose and all that. Well, yeah, Mom, but in your day, didn't you guys, you know, listen to the Beatles and jump around or Elvis <laughs> Presley, wiggle your legs, and your parents told you that wasn't right? Mom, it's like, it's kind of the, the style of the day today. You know, it's just what we do. We play video games. It's just what we do today, Mom, and I love you so much, and I'm sorry it affects you that way, but, but please don't stop loving me. You know, because I sure haven't stopped loving you, and I don't want to offend you in any way. I want to talk to you about these things. It's amazing how this opens up. And I'll give you a great example of this. I had a distributor in New York with Paul Mitchell. And uh, it was a lady distributor. And she could not stand Venny Musum. So she said, do not put Venny Musum in my area as a regional manager. I can't stand this guy. He's of no value to me. Well, we were realizing, realigning territory, so we moved to New Jersey from New York. Anyways, a few years go by, and Venny says, you know, I've always felt bad that Diane didn't like me. I don't know why. She just didn't like me, and it's always made me feel bad. I said, Venny, call Diane up on the phone and say to Diane, Diane, I just wanted, after all these years, to apologize to you. I'm so sorry for everything I've done to upset you. Please help me in life. Tell me the things I've done wrong so as I go forward in the future, I could make them right. And I apologize for everything, anything I did, Diane. I should have done this a couple of years ago with you. Please help me. By the time the conversation was over with, as Benny told me, she was crying, he was crying. They went back, had lunch together, hugged each other. And she called me and said, can Benny be my regional manager again? And then there was a year or two later, we were moving Ellen Barbaro uh, from New Hampshire down into New York. And Diane said, but don't take Vinny from me. Let me still have Vinny. <laughs> you win by losing sometimes. Uh, the power of an apology and forgiveness, it, it actually strengthens the relationship sure. in business. Even when you, when you make a mistake, you go so far out of your way to correct it, where the customer sees they care so much, even though they screwed up, 
you, you'll get more business from them with the apology. That's correct. Very correct. I want to open up to student questions. This is I could go on for hours. This is yes, fascinating. Sir. Look at him running the show around. Those are first time. We, we got to get mics okay. so they can be on there. Thank you so much for coming. It was really amazing to hear your story. Um, I just want to know what's your favorite sales pitch, as well as what inspired you to start Rocket. Very good. I started Rocket several. I'll start with Rocket first. I started Rocket several years ago. And I started it because I knew there's a different way to do things. And I thought, let me just compete with some of the biggest people in there. And we had a couple of ideas, like a bundle, where for $14.95, you got telemedicine, you got phone calls, you got roadside assistance, everything you could ever imagine. Then we went into the phone business. How can we be disruptive and run across someone that was working on a technology for 3D without glasses? And I said, boy, let's see if we can amalgamate that and music and other things together. So it was exciting. And I knew at the end of many, many years, a lot of money. I was doing well with Patron, so I made take, take some of my Patron money and put it in there. And uh, we created this in Egypt because we thought it would be unique. And what drove me to do it was if I could develop the finest phone in the world for the least expensive price for something of that quality, it's the greatest good for the greatest number. Now I'm taking care of everybody. You know, and, and at the same time, give them something new and different. In my sales presentations, I can give you a very quick one right now. This is a bottle of shampoo one, or co the conditioner, let's say, right? And you're a salon, oh, you're a salon owner. You look like you could be a salon owner, okay? And I want to sell her this. First of all, I want to go inside and say, hi, how are you? I'm, I'm John Paul DeJory, and I have a new company called Paul Mitchell. Just take me a minute to tell you about our new product. This, by the way, see I'm holding this like a gem. Okay, I'm not holding it like this, I'm holding it as if it were a gem, but it's a bottle of shampoo. Pretend. Yeah. This is our new The Conditioner, one of the most revolutionary things you've ever used. Let me show you how it works. Watch, I'm going to put the sides of a dime on my hand. Can I have your hand, please? Yes. Okay. Just a drop it. Oh, no, but watch this, okay. And I would put a, l a little bit on her hand, right? Now, she doesn't know what to do with that, right? I've got her full attention. Let me tell you about what's in <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, she's still got her head. Okay, let, me, let, let me tell you about what this product does, okay? This product is a, it, first of all, you leave it in your hair. It's a moisture treatment, a protein treatment, a nucleic acid treatment. It stops the blow dryer from damaging your hair. When you cut hair, by the way, it cuts it even cleaner. But you know what? This is a leave-in conditioner. Rub your hands together. Now she's, good, now she's got her hands in it, right? Okay. This new, has just neutralized every chemical in your hand. You put it on your hair and you leave it in your hair. It's good for your skin too. I've just incorporated your in. Okay, now let's say I wanted to sell her. I'll give you. A, I mean, then I show her. That's the conditioner, right? Then here's shampoo one. Here's shampoo two. Those are our first three products. But now I want her to buy it. So here's my closing sales presentation. Very very short. Okay, it's this. I'd like to make you a very special offer. First of all, I want her to put my products on the shelf and I want her to use them. If you will agree, good song. If you, will agree, if you will agree, if you will agree to put two dozen of these on your shelf at eye level so it's elegant, two dozen of each one, the shampoo one, shampoo two, and the conditioner on your shelf, okay, and some of our larger quart sizes at your back basin, you know, for professional size shampoos and such, and whenever a customer comes on the chair, tell them what shampoo you used on them and why you use this conditioner. If you will do that, and let me come in and hold a little class for your salon, if you will do that, that and agree to do that, I in return will do this. I will give you three dozen of this, three dozen of this, three dozen of this, a couple of quarts each for the back bar, I'll come in and hold a class, and in 30 days, one month, if you're not completely happy, like this one, the finest products you've ever used, I'll come back and take every bottle off the shelf that you haven't used or sold out the door and give you your money back. Now that's fair enough, isn't it? I'm looking at it now, okay now. But, but, no, okay, but, remember I said, you gotta have three no's or it's not a no. Tell me no. No, no why? Okay, and I can understand, we're brand new, we came into the area, but it's, and I can understand your hesitation. Perfectly right, fully understand and I agree with you. However, I know you're gonna be so successful, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you will agree to only put one dozen each on the shelf, a couple at the back basin, and at your station, use it. Let us come in and hold a class for you, free of charge. With that small amount, if in a period of three weeks to a month, 
you're not completely happy, I take every bottle off the shelf you haven't used or sold out the door and give you your money back. Now that's fair enough, isn't it? <laughs> See, it's hard to say no when someone said that. <laughs> I mean, we can go back and forth. I, mean, I went this one salon, it was in Detroit, Michigan. I was with Mr. Ken Maley. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm using all these products. Like, no, 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 no. At the very end, I said, OK, I'll tell you what. I know you're going to love these products. If you will take one bottle of shampoo, one, one bottle of shampoo, one bottle of conditioner, and put two of each underneath. I mean, that's less than a dozen, right? And it's not the hottest thing you've ever had in one week. I will come back in those few bottles, Mr. Maley, give your money back. Is that fair enough? And he goes, well, of course that's fair enough. Are you kidding? It's less than it does. That's nothing. I said, exactly. All I want to ask you is this. It's not going to take away from any customer you have. When you have a customer that's sitting in your chair that's not buying one of those products off the shelf, and then those days no one bought products off the shelf, okay? Just take my products out and tell them what the conditioner does. That's all you got to do. Well, very long story short, within one year, half the salon was all Paul Mitchell products. Why? Because one, it was very few, but he put it on the shelf in front of him and told people about it. Well, when you do this, you know, one in five is going to buy it, you know. And it was the hottest thing he ever had in his life. Everything was gone in one day. So he had to call Mr. Ken Maley and reorder. Okay. Hi. Yes. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for coming and sharing so many great stories. Um, I wanted to ask you, but you might have already answered my question through your whole pitch, how you were able to convince people to buy your brand of tequila Patron at the price when it was around 4 to $5. Excellent question. Extremely difficult. When I went to Wolfgang Puck at Spago's, I said, Wolf, what do you think? He said, JP is the best tequila I ha I've ever tasted in my life. I said, Wolf, you're a friend of mine, but would you mind if I dropped off a case to you? Give it to some of your celebrity friends. Oh, JP would love to, right? Because it is unique, and it was a high-end restaurant, very high-end restaurant. Great. So within a matter of a couple of months, uh, there were groups now going on the road with cases of Patron, because he turned them on to it. At Baja Cantina, when Martin signed them, but these are our first two big accounts, Baja Cantina, Marina Del Rey, we held a party for them. We brought a couple of very shall we say, sexy dressed ladies in there, you know, there were just fun ladies with tequila here and little shot glasses here. We had a party that started pouring it for people. And uh, wow, they said, oh, that's great. So bars started serving it first. And then we also would go into a bar or a restaurant that we didn't know anybody in. And I would walk with a little case with a bottle of Patron in it. And I'd walk up, and you could do this in California. We started in California. I would sit at the bar, and I would say, Bartender, I want to buy you a, gla a shot of tequila. Well, you could do this. It's legal in California. And the shot in those days was 3 or $4 a shot. So he would get whatever his top one was, you know, pour it in, take a shot. He goes, well, thank you very much. He said, well, how about for you? You want to order? I said, no, I just want to order for you, but I want you to taste something. And I brought out the Patron bottle, put it in an empty glass, and said, taste this. He goes, wow, that's smooth. I said, that's the future of tequila, it's Patron. And we have a wine merchant down here that is the one that's selling it now. And that's what we did. It was door to door, presentation to presentation, showing how good our product was. We were very proud. In fact, my wife tells a story. We started in 89, I met Eloise in 1991. When I first met her, there was a couple bottles of Patron tequila in the back seat of my car. And she didn't know if I was an alcoholic or what. And then we went over to visit a mutual person we knew, and I brought the bottle with me. Well, later she found out that was my company, Patron. <laughs> yes? Uh, well, no, he's in charge. He's got to say yes. Sorry. OK, yes. OK. okay. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you for all the awesome stories, and thank you for the delicious tequila. Um, <laughs> I'm a beverage entre entrepreneur in year one. I have an energy drink called Go Hard, and I was wondering if you have any advice uh, for dealing with distributors and, uh, and building a company, kind of like company culture type of stuff. Great question. It's a part, I, I, there's so much to tell you guys, I don't have enough time. How did I even get a distributor with Paul Mitchell? Let me go back there. How in the world did I get a distributor with Paul Mitchell? Nobody wanted to carry us. So remember the little story about going up Ventura Boulevard? When I went up Ventura Boulevard, I sold 12 different salons a little bit of product, anywhere from maybe $20 to $125. And I got 12 checks. I had them leave the name portion of the check open, like who it's made out to open. And I went down to Paris Ace Beauty Supply in Los Angeles, big supply house. And I said, hi, how you doing? I'm John Paul, and I want to show you the greatest product in the world. I showed him my products, and he said to me, 
why in the world would I want to take on the biggest supply house here in Southern California, the biggest distributor of beauty products was Sparisace in those days. You know, and why would I want to take this? I have a lean curse, I have Reckon, I have Matrix, I have all these giant big brands. Why would I want to take time and money to start a new brand like yours? You're a nice man, but no, no we don't do that. So I said, sir, I have a very good reason for that. And I pulled out 12 checks. I laid them right in front of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. He looks at them. Those are your first 12 customers. I sold them for you. And if you'll just buy from me, and we were very hard up in those days, $2,000 worth of product, you will be my distributor for all of LA County and Orange County. And he laughed his head off and says, will you come in and show my salesman how to do what you just did? You just gave him the first 12 accounts. Yes, I will, gladly. I said, but there's one thing I want to ask you, and this is a question you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you the answer. Uh, and everybody, most people, when you sell them something, a distributor wants 30 to 45 days to pay for it. We didn't have any money. Like, broke. We needed money. So I said, Mr. Hendrietta, would you be so kind, sir, as to, when I deliver the products, write me a check? He said, we're Parise Speedy Supply. We pay our bills in 45 days. I'm taking your line on. You will get it. In fact, if you sell all the products before that time, I'll do it one time, and I'll, I'll give you a break here and do it. Well, what he was not aware was that in my mind, I had already calculated this out. I said, sir, I'd be very happy to not only know that you're helping me out, but I'll give you a 5% discount if you do it right now. I already worked it into the price. In other words, I overcharged 5% because I knew I'm gonna give it back to every single person, okay? <laughs> and he laughed his head off. In fact, he came to our 25th year reunion for all of our disturbance and told the story. So, so JP walks out, he says, and he says, I can't believe this guy. My God, I promised him I'd give him the money when he gets here, which I will do, you know, what a presentation. He said within five minutes, he got a phone call from the warehouse man. The warehouse man says, Jim, you better get back here. There's some guy here named JP who just unloaded product on the dock and he wants $2,000. He's just in my office. I had it in the car, <laughs> so I went around back and loaded it. So that was the way I got distribution and that's how I got my bill paid early. And by the way, we do the same, and I'm not going to mention, but one of our giant accounts for Rocket, they don't pay their bill for 90 days. And everybody gets their bill paid in 90 days. But something quite similar, but without the discount I did with them, and end result was within 14 days they'll give us money. Good questions, by the way. Great questions. The hardest person was, well, actually, you know, was, I would say it was Jim Hendrietta, the, I, the experience I just gave you. I mean, because he didn't want us, period. He didn't want us, you know, and that was the way to get in. So once you do something like that, it's a lot easier after that. My gosh, it's a lot easier after that. I mean, I've sold, tried to sell a lot of people. A lot of people have said no to me. But he was the toughest. The biggest distributor in L.A. had every other line, had no reason to take us on. And I told you how I got him. I, I want to thank you for coming today and meeting us here in our last class. Um, my question is, you brought up failure and preparing for failure. So um, if, you, if you're prepared for, set, for failure, you said you'll be ready for it. But if you put that in your mindset already, aren't you setting yourself up for failure? And then my next question is, do you ever drink vodka as a hard alcohol? Very good question. The answer is no. I'm a wine and tequila guy, OK? That's it. But no, I didn't say prepare for failure, I said be prepared for rejection. Big difference. You're not prepared for failure. If you're rejected, that's not failure. If you sold something to 20 people and they said, no, you didn't fail. You were rejected. No, you don't set yourself up for, I'm going to fail. You set it up for rejection. It's just one of the stones along the way. So I see the river runs, there's stones. It goes right around it. You're just setting yourself up. This fellow here was raising hands a few times too. This gentleman here, is that okay? To call your attention to him. Uh, I'm Megan, and thank you for coming here today. I feel like I just hit the jackpot because I sell confidence Where through my right, right here. Oh, hi, Megan. Yes, Megan. I can see you. All right. So, hi, I'm Megan, and um, I feel like I hit the jackpot today because I sell confidence through my hairline. 
And what I want to know is, how do you position yourself in the beginning if you know you want to scale? I want a hamburger school, so what do I need to do now to set myself up for that? To sell what? Well, to, scale, to scale. So say, for example, with my product line, if I want to be able to scale it and have hamburger school, I want to do like a McDonald's model. And I want to know, how do you position yourself like that in the beginning? What do you need to think about? Okay, what you want to think about is this. The first, like take McDonald's, okay? The first unit they did, the first unit they did was successful. Ray Kroc came in there. He was the guy that took it everywhere, right? He came in there and found a way to make it even better, cleaner, leaner, and approach people. So to scale up, if it's doors or locations, you got to get the first one going perfect, the second, and the third. Once you have them going perfect and you have your your example, okay, then you could go to a bank or to others to raise more money if you have to. Or like we did it, we just did it off with little money we made and grew and grew and grew. And the way I did it is this, which might be helpful. For the first several years at Paul Mitchell, I mean, we lived very, very modestly. When we started making some big money, I did not change my life for one year. I didn't have a better way of life, live in a better place, eat better food. I kept my lifestyle exactly the same for one entire year. And then going into the second year, I raised it a little bit. It was, I didn't blow it. I have friends of mine in the entertainment industry that think it's going to never end. And they're like one hit wonders or one movie wonders. And they're broke within a year or two, completely broke. So they think it'll always be there. So never live beyond your means until you get so far above your means that you can live up a little bit, but never touch your means to be able to do it. And again, when you have something, good, whether it's a single product, like at Paul Mitchell, has we could afford to bring out one more product, we would add on one at a time. When we got bigger, of course, we get on a couple at a time. But we remembered this, we never forgot. The product we made, or a service, if you have a service to sell, has to be so good, you want to be in the reorder business. People want to reorder it. And just, just an inch at a time. You know, Take a little bit and expand, a little bit and expand. Get your first student going really big, and then you go bigger. Hope that was helpful. Thank you for coming. I just wanted to ask a more specific question. Was it hard for you to go into the tequila industry as a foreigner? And like, were there any issues that you had with um, Mexico and the government? Because I know that tequila is often very like limited to where you can grow the plants and right. where you can actually like expand to. And was that was it, were there any difficulties with that? No, I think the reason there weren't any difficulties is no one thought we would make it. They thought, here's these guys, these gringos, right, that are just you know, buying tequila. They bought a 1,000 cases. Well, we hope they'll sell it because we know what they paid for it because the type of tequila they used was so darn expensive to make. They paid no attention to us. By the time we made our mark, we were too big to kick out. And we, we were humble. By the way, we were humble. Would you please excuse me? We think we've got a chance to go. So we were very humble about the whole thing because we were humble. Yeah, you know, we know what we were going to do with it. We had not a clue. If you guys have, it's only a couple bucks. Rent Good Fortune, the movie, tells our story. You know, where you know we didn't even know what we didn't have a clue of what to, how to sell this stuff. Didn't even have a clue at first, but we believed what we were doing. We stayed humble. Hi. Um, so my question is more about the mindset stuff you were talking about earlier, specifically what you were saying about forgiveness. Um, yesterday in Dr. Fox's class, we talked about the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation and how forgiveness is really something you do for yourself, but reconciliation, you know, involves the cooperation of another person. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, how you view forgiveness and you mentioned like calling a friend and trying to talk through the situation and do you view that as being something you do for yourself or to kind of amend the problem? I, I see that when you do that. It's not a problem, it was a challenge, first of all. I, I don't like to use the word problem because things are a challenge. And usually with a problem, you find an answer anyway. So we consider it a challenge. We have a challenge, and the main way to confront a challenge is just to confront it. If you could get face to face with somebody, okay, you're going to confront it, you're going to handle it. If you get a flat tire, a lot of people just sit around wait for someone to come by and help them. But if you know how to change a tire, you jump out of the car, you start changing that tire, you confronted the situation. You get right in front of the situation and you confront it with honesty. Whether it's talking to somebody or getting something done, you just confront it with honesty. And then shut up, let the other person talk. <laughs> let the other person talk as much as they want to. And don't interrupt them one bit. Let them interrupt you, but don't interrupt them. By the end of that period of time, you're in pretty good shape. Well, if you could give me an incident, maybe I could help you. Is there any particular incident? You have to use names or 
Okay, but your mindset should be that what you deal in life with are challenges. Not problems, challenges. We, I don't know why they call them problems, because that's the word someone came with. It's a problem. Now, oh, shit, it's a problem. My God, what am I going to do? I have a problem. I have a challenge. What do you do with the challenge? You overcome the challenge. So your mindset should be you have challenges. Not a problem. You have challenges out there. You address it right in front of it. You either fix it in front of it, or you talk to somebody about it. Okay? Oh, right over here. And by the way, before you're done, this gentleman, this gentleman, raising their hands there, we got to get them eventually. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, everyone's uh, special. In it. True. Um, so first off, I want to let you know I'm also a John Marshall alum. Yay! Marshall. <laughs> Barrister. Yeah. <laughs> a few years ago. Um, what I wanted to ask you is what kind of values embody both your professional and personal life? Because you talked about your work culture and how you treat your employees, but how does that translate into life? Yeah, right? ideally is treating everybody the way you'd want to be treated. That, that's really to really simplify it. Be kind to everybody. I'll get up in the morning, walk down the street and say hello to you. I don't know you. I'll say hello to you, I'll smile at you. And that's what I want people to do back to me. Again, it's going back to do unto others, you'll have others do unto you. And start out by doing it in the morning, as soon as you wake up. In fact, try this tomorrow. When you wake up, if you have a roommate, do it with your roommate. When you walk out door, do it with the first person you see. If you have a dog, do it with your dog. Smile, just smile. Wake up and say, hi, how you doing? Good morning. Even if it's the day after the night before, hi, good morning, how you doing? In other words, smile. Uh, it's, it's the power of a smile is amazing. I've been on elevators before where I just turn, I mean, people are like, mm, you know, they're not having a good morning. I just turn around and look them and say, hi, guys, how y'all doing? Right? <laughs> and they'll go, you know, like that. They're not used to so much, right? And so they'll go, hi, we're doing okay. And they'll smile. I get a smile or two, you know. And when I get off the elevator, I'm sure they talk about me. But they're smiling and talking. They're not like, hmm. Hi, my name's Nate. I uh, just wanted to say you're a living legend. This is amazing. My question is, when you get a, reg uh, a rejection and you feel smaller after that regression, after that rejection, what can you say uh, to handle that situation gracefully and, and to feel less small? It depends on what it is. If you were to say to me, that's never going to work, it's impossible, good luck, buddy, you had a good idea, but not quite, you know, something like that. All you do is say, you know, I can appreciate that. Cool words, I can really appreciate that, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, man. I'm just going to do it, no matter what they say. Even if you screwed up and they're putting you down because they say, no problem, so I can appreciate you thinking like that, and thank you for sharing that with me, but I'm going to make it and smile at them and nod. I'm going to make it. Thank you. Your mindset and you are gonna make it hi thank you so much for your time um, my first question is when you guys had a minority kind of market share with Patron at first <laughs> yeah because <laughs> a lot of people don't understand but like the alcohol industry is really controlled by a few conglomerates that kind of own all the all the smaller brands and acquire them really at early stages um, how do you go about kind of branching up from having a local wine store as your distributor to then Jim Bean and then Bacardi, and then do your own distribution. And the second question is, uh, what's your thoughts and perspectives on kind of the current emerging Mescal market? Do you think that'll be a threat to tequila or kind of just a compliment and kind of your general insight on that? Two very, very good questions, okay? With Patron Tequila, to get into a market we have giants, I had something they didn't have. I had an ultra-premium tequila. Once you tasted it, you wanted it. And then I also held with Paul Mitchell a seminar for 3,000 of the top salon owners in the United States and served them all free Patron. They went home, hey, you got to get Patron tequila. This stuff is great. And then some of my friends jumped in. Clint Eastwood was one of them. Uh, we were in business a couple of years, and uh, Clint uh, called me up one day and said, uh, JP, I've got a surprise for you. Are you still going out with that girl, Eloise? Said, yeah, Clint, I'm still going out with her. I'll probably marry her one day. He goes, okay, you're going to really impress her. I have a new movie coming out in the line of fire where I'm a Secret Service agent, and I, I've got great seats for you. You go, oh, cool, man. I get to go to a premiere of a movie. You know, Clint Eastwood's there. I got to really impress Eloise here. You know, all excited. So I go down there. And Clint's in New York City doing another premiere, right? The producer finds me and says, oh, there you are, JP. I was looking for you. Hey, here. We got these two seats right next to me. So I said, oh, that was a surprise. I got to sit next to the, the producer and the directors. And I got these great seats. I'm impressing here in the middle of the theater. And we got free popcorn and free Pepsi. They didn't have Coke in that. It was Pepsi. Pepsi and free popcorn. Oh, this is great. That wasn't the surprise. 
The only thing he drank in the entire movie was Patron tequila. And the most sensitive spot of the movie was him and the terrorist trying to kill the president. He's there with the ball patron sipping and trying to talk the, the, the guy out of killing the president. <laughs> Things like that. And uh, oh, God, a lot of just, put this way, dear friends of mine, and later in the entertainment industry, just started telling people about it. And if you have, remember I said in the beginning, make sure you're in the resale business. The quality of your product must be so good. People want to reorder it or tell others about it. That's what I do with the quality. So I would feel good walking to anybody and say, try this. It's the best you'll ever taste. Because I knew that within. Mescal, we looked at Mescal at Patron several years ago. And it didn't seem like the right market we wanted to be in at the time. But I am noticing now that there's many little Mescal places opening up, even in Austin, Texas, which is my main residence now. We, uh, we have a Mescal bar. They have lots of different Mescals. My dear friend Cheech Marin, like Cheech and Chong, Cheech has his own little Mescal too, right? So I look at it this way. Right now, it is a fad. It's not a trend yet, it's a fad. And it's just a matter of time, and let's see how it's gonna work itself out. Uh, the industry has gotta make that mezcal a little bit mellower, and I think they're starting to do that right now. So it has a good opportunity. So it's a matter of, uh, like, do you like this kind of gin, or do you like uh, a bourbon? You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Do you, do you like tequila, or do you like mezcal, or a combination of both? Because it comes from a different type of cactus, okay? This gentleman here has had his hands up so many times. He was so kind to come drive over with me here. All right, Nick. Hello again, Mrs. Joria. Yes, um, first, I just want to say thank you for your kindness earlier because um, that made my day. Um, so my question is, you talk about being in the reorder business and your product is so good. I had a mindset question. Are you someone who is on the search for opportunities constantly or does life just happen and you know a good opportunity when it happens? brilliant question and an answer for everybody. It just happened. Okay. I was searching for these things, just somehow they came to me. But I will share something with you. And if you see in the good fortune, you'll see, well, this guy here got fired from three different jobs, and all of a sudden, in the same industry, he had, he had started something else. And what that's all about is have some faith in yourself and your future on what you could do, but also have faith in the universe. Very interesting. I worked for Redkin, fired me because of animals. Institute of Trichology, fired me because I made more than the president, even though I built their company three times its size. And the third company I worked for was one called Fermadil. Syntex had bought Fermadil. It was a hair care company. And I had a 50% increase my first year. I was also fired from that job because I wasn't one of the upper management guys. I wasn't their same ethnic group and several other reasons why. No problem. Two years after I started Paul Mitchell, and I did great with all these companies. I was like, you know, I, I made them money, I did great. Two years after I started Paul Mitchell, we made our first profits. An epiphany hit me. If it wasn't for what I learned at Redkin and Fermadel and the Institute of Trichology, it would have been impossible for me to start Paul Mitchell. Impossible. Whether it was $300 or half a million dollars, impossible. I learned from one distribution, the other one packaging, marketing, the other one raw goods and where you get it from. In other words, I didn't quit. I was fired. And I'm sort of glad I did. But in my life, the universe was telling me, without me knowing it, no, you need another experience. Don't you? you need this experience. And so what happened was, and we go back to when you have failures or you someone tells you you're not going to make it or, you, or you know, they really put you down, whatever, don't, don't give up because it could be what you just learned or what you just lost. But what you thought you failed at was an experience you need right now for something that's going to happen in the future. And that's a true story. Those three companies that had not worked for him, I couldn't have made Paul Mitchell that successful. Good lesson. Thank you. You're very welcome. Can you pass this down? Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my question, it sort of spins off um, the last one, and it's about quality. So something that you've touched on a lot is the importance of quality. You know, you can be confident, you can sort of persevere, but it really comes back to to that. And so my question for you is if you have any best tips, best practices for really identifying and trusting quality and how to kind of cultivate and maintain that. If you have a product, use it on yourself first so it's the best you've ever used, 
okay? Or if it's a product you're not going to use on yourself, like it's an engineering tool or a carpenter's tool, have someone that's there use it until they tell you it's exactly perfect. In other words, you want that behind you. If it's a service and you know about the service, go to people that have that service and say, if I offer the service this way, is it better than what you have right now? If not, what do I have to do? Actually go out there and get in the field and ask people so that you could specialize on their needs. You want to fulfill a need in the marketplace, not in some cases create the need. Though you can do that off like the 3D phone, everybody loves it. What I'd like to do with everybody here, especially, I'm non-political by the way, I happen to be what they call an independent. I have friends that are Republicans, friends that are Democrats, friends that are independents, Green Party, I mean just, I'm all over the place. But I want to share something with you because we're in, a, in an unusual type of situation here. And what I want to share with you on life is choices you can make. About three years ago, Aaron Burnett had me go on CNN. And I was representing the 1%, the billionaires, right? And it was JP, you know, we've got the 99, this is during the Obama administration. You know, uh, they're saying here, the administration, the 99% have nothing or very little. The 1% have everything. The 1% should just give, be giving their money to the 99% are doing more things. Let's tax everybody more. And that was kind of the feeling of several years ago, right? Is the 99, they had the march on Wall Street, everything else. So I told them to their surprise, well, thank you. But I'm not only the 99% and the 1%, I'm all of it. I'm 100%. Isn't it we the people of the United States of America? Isn't it we the people? Isn't the American dream to be able to own your own house? And isn't the American dream, this great country, to be able to be a millionaire if it's possible? And the, the politicians are saying that's wrong? Russia didn't work. Socialism doesn't work. Everyone that's tried it has failed miserably. <laughs> failed miserably. What does work is we the people working together. And I'll give you a quick example. There were in the Appalachian Mountains in 2010, 150,000 people that were out of work. The uh, mills closed down, coal mines, a lot of stuff happened. They were out of work, good, hardworking people. What did our federal government do? They sent them food stamps and a little bit of money. This sucked. That's not what you do, it's we the people. So what did I do? I went looking at how I could help them out. Long story short, in 2010, I started Grow Appalachia. I gave them all the money. I took Bria College in Eastern Virginia, I'm sorry, Eastern Kentucky to work with me on this. I supplied the money. We went out there in the community and we got these people without jobs and I got them into gardening. I bought their seeds, their fertilizer, their equipment, everything they had to do, hired a couple guys full-time, got a bunch of volunteers, started in Lincoln County, Kentucky, and worked out from there. And the thing was this, I'll buy it all for you, and I'll, we're going to show you how to use it. First year, you, buy enough, you grow enough vegetables to feed yourself, and we're going to teach how to can in jars for the winter. So you have food all year long. Second year, now you know how to grow. You grow more. You take the excessive food that you're growing and you sell it to local grocery stores. Every local grocery store and market has local organically grown produce. And go to a farmer's market, sell there also. Now you've got an income. All of a sudden we added on, here's 12 chickens and a rooster. Here's some bees for honey. Today, over 40,000 people eat off of those gardens. Over 40,000 people, maybe even 50,000 people by now. And they, they're making soap, they have honey, they have all kinds of things. In other words, America works if you give someone the opportunity to stick your hand out and say, give me, give me this free, I want more fringe benefit. It creates people not working. It creates people, why should I work? Are you kidding, I'm getting all this stuff free. Why do I have to work? In my portion of my closing, the oyster and the eagle is a story you all have to know. It's my favorite one, especially to tell young people. In the beginning, God created the earth. Now, if you're an atheist, it's perfectly okay. Call it the, the natural universe created the planet. Call it whatever you want. I'm just going to say God for now. It's just one word we can use. It's God. Call it all God. Okay, God. And he created, first of all, an oyster. He said, oyster, I'm going to put you in the most perfect social economic situation you could ever be in. I'm going to make you a shell. You're going to live in a shell. That's your house and your clothes. And I'm going to put you at the bottom of the ocean to protect you from your enemies. If you're hungry, all you do is open your mouth and food rushes in. Food, clothing, shelter, and care. You don't have to do a darn thing. Just be there. Perfect socialism. Perfect welfare. 
but you're not going to go anywhere oyster. You're just going to kind of sit there, have a free house, free clothes. And uh, as Earl Nightingale said so clearly, too many people on the planet tiptoe through life to make us safely to death. Well, what can I get free? What's a for sure job that's going to give me money? Then God created something else, and he called it an eagle. He said, an eagle, you're a whole different type of species. Eagle, go build your own house. God, where do I build a house? I don't know. Top of a tree, top of a mountain, you figured it out. Okay, God, what am I going to eat? Eagle, you figure that one out too. You got big wings to fly around. You go fly around, you find your own food. The eagle will fly through miles of wind, snow, sleet, slate, everything you could ever imagine to find food to feed its young. Very few people know this. The eagle is the only animal in the world that'll fly into a hurricane to ride the thermals and play. Another thing most people don't know is the eagle is the most powerful bird in the sky and it fails 95% of the time. It's not like a hawk which is quick and fast and goes in. It's so big and cumbersome and it's going after wild animals that when it comes down on the mouse or whatever it's going to eat, right, it comes down on it, those little animals feel it, know it, and take off. Only 5% of the time does the eagle succeed and get his food. But he doesn't say, I failed. He just keeps on going. It was a challenge. So he gets his 5%. The eagle is well fed. He's strong as can be. And the big difference, too, is this. The eagle can go anywhere it wants. The oyster can't. The eagle can go anywhere it wants. The eagle, and not the oyster, is the emblem of America. And it defines, really, what life is all about. You get out there and do it yourself. Climb mountains. Travel. Do whatever you like. Don't get stuck where someone else is taking care of you and you have no contribution, but it's free, free, free. I got everything free. I'm on top of the world. That's not living. Living is not necessarily how many years you live. And I can't even tell you what great person said this, but he did. He said, living is not how many years you live. It's how you've lived those years, if you did live them. Or did you just get boring and just let them pass you by? I think you're all eagles here. I learned a little story when I came here. And I didn't even know this. I had no idea. Your university and other universities have homeless people going to school here. I had no idea. You talk about an eagle, homeless, sleeping in the library, God knows what, but yet going to college to get a degree to do whatever they want in life, boy, that's an eagle. Thank you very much. master's class in mindset, in starting a company, in marketing, and branding, and sales. You've really got all that. You're the perfect punctuation mark to this semester. I watched John, who while he's working everything, take four pages of notes. Did you guys take a lot of notes? Some good stuff there. Let's, let's give something back to JP. I want you to think of what lesson or quote or piece of advice that you got tonight from him, and I know there were a ton. I, I can't wait to watch this and take it myself. And I want you to give it to me very quickly. And I'm going to record this for you as a little gift cool. to take away with you. Who's ready with a piece of advice? And I want you to speak up very loudly. Ready? Selling is helping someone make the right decision. Success and shared is failure. Leave it at the river. Be an eagle, not an oyster. <laughs> Trust the universe. Look at them in the eye. Go to happy hour. <laughs> be, be prepared for rejections. Be prepared for rejection. Go. Treat others like you would like to be treated. You win by losing. Challenges, not problems. Rejection is not failure. Success and shared is failure. Success is nothing if it's not shared. Success is defined by what you do when no one is watching. The world is in front of you and you can use it any way you want. Get into the reordering business. Coming down, coming down. Come. Leave it at the river. It's not a problem, it's a challenge. This is a good one. Those are real good ones. <laughs> okay, there we go. Hold on, go. go.
Life is not how many uh, years you've lived, but how you lived them. Excellent. Giving back is the best high you can get. Do well and do good. The first no just means you haven't convinced them yet. Features tell, benefits sell. The power of a smile is amazing. Tape your worries on your bathroom mirror. You can't change yesterday's newspaper. Go into the reorder business. Up top, here we go. Well, you do what you do when nobody's watching. Losing can sometimes mean winning. Failure equals a college class. Look into their eyebrows. <laughs> Help me thank John Paul DeGioia.